Okay, so this is a quick outline of my talk. Uh, I'll first start with uh, the data processing uh, landscape at Twitter. What kind of batch processing pipelines do we run? Uh, what kinds of workloads are these? That should give you a sense of uh, what, what our problems are. And then I'll do a quick introduction to Scalding, which is a framework for data batch data processing that was originally implemented at Twitter about 10 years ago, I think, and is widely used at Twitter even today. Um, and uh, then I'll talk about this Beam backend for Scalding. So Scalding has this option to plug in different backends. Uh, and we have been working on a Beam backend for it. That is the bulk of this talk. And finally, I'll talk about the current and future state of this particular backend for this uh, for Beam. OK, so what does batch data processing at Twitter look like today? We have uh, over 50,000 batch uh, data jobs that run on a daily basis. Uh, by 50,000 here, I mean MapReduce jobs uh, running on our on-prem Hadoop clusters. They process over 200 petabytes of data on a daily basis. And we have several Hadoop cluster installations in two different uh, data centers uh, managed entirely by us. Right? And across all of these clusters, we have over 50,000 odd nodes. So it's a pretty large oper operation managed by our team uh, of I don't know, it's a pretty large number of probably 30 to 40 engineers now between SREs and the different engineers managing this. So that's kind of what we're working with here. And what we're trying to do at this point is, and this has been happening for the last two or three years now, we are in the process of migrating all of our workloads uh, to the cloud. And our choice for cloud has been uh, Google for this analytics use cases and um, for both batch and streaming uh, workloads at Twitter. And within Google, we've chosen Google's Cloud Dataflow as our uh, option for batch, uh, both batch and streaming processing. And um, th these are some of the reasons why we chose that. Some of them are, most of these are pretty obvious to most uh, people, I think. So Beam, uh, obviously, uh, one of the major reasons for choosing Beam, uh, for choosing Dataflow was, in fact, Beam, because of this ability to use the same API for batch and stream processing. And then with Dataflow, we get a fully managed service. Um, that takes some of the load off of the data platform. Um, and then the ability to leverage other technologies within Google's cloud ecosystem, right? We have uh, we are pretty heavy users of BigQuery. Uh, there's a lot of systems, PubSub. There's a lot of things within uh, Google's cloud that we use. And obviously, the elasticity. Where this comes in really handy is with our on-prem clusters, it can be pretty hard. Sometimes we have teams asking us to increase the capacity on our on-prem clusters. This can be a month-long process, for example, in some cases. So on the Google Cloud, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so that's why we've picked Dataflow. But we've also made another alternative available to engineers, which is uh, we've gone and installed Hadoop clusters on Google's VMs very similar to what we have with our on-prem installations, right? So exactly how we have on-prem Hadoop clusters, we've gone and installed those clusters similarly on GCP. So these are the two alternatives we've been providing uh, other teams at Twitter for running their batch processing workloads in the cloud. Now, if you are the owner of a batch processing job, right, uh, uh, or any pipeline, today it's Scalding. Mostly most people today use Scalding within Twitter. You've got two options, right? You can either rewrite your batch job completely from scratch uh, into the Apache Beams API and then deploy it to Dataflow. That's one way to do it. The other is what we call a lift and shift, where you take this pipeline and instead keep the code as is. It's still a scalding job, except that it's now running on the Hadoop cluster that we've installed on GCP. So those are pretty straightforward options, right? The problem is both of them have some problems, right? With the with the First option of rewriting your bad jobs to Beam, the issue is you've got to do a manual rewrite. And at our scale, this is uh, a pretty, this is going to be a pretty major operation. 5,000 5, plus scalding jobs uh, run today. And having each one rewritten is not something that we can do today at Twitter scale, right? This might be a multi year effort uh, if we went down this path. What looks more attractive, obviously, is this lift and shift uh, approach. Uh, and really, we've set up this tooling in such a way that you point your scalding job at a cluster and deploy it there, right? So now, instead of pointing to an on-prem cluster, you just point it to one of the clusters we've set up on the cloud and deploy it there. That works and makes things very convenient. The only drawback is that it's still MapReduce. Underneath, scalding is just running MapReduce. MapReduce is 20-plus-year-old technology. and 
doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're moving to Google Cloud and still trying to run MapReduce jobs, right? So both of these options have their own uh, disadvantages. So when we started thinking about this problem, that's when we were thinking, OK, this might be a good one where we can solve both of these to a certain extent by implementing a new backend for Apache Beam for Scalding. Now you can see that if you had a different backend for Scalding, which is Beam, then you get a little bit of both of these. You don't have to rewrite your jobs. You just keep your Scalding code as is, plug in your new Beam backend, and now your Scalding job is suddenly deployed to Dataflow without a code change. And it looks a lot like a lift and shift migration because you're not doing anything really with the code. You know, it just it just runs on data flow. So that is kind of the motivation for trying to do this. Um, so before I go into the details of the Beam backend, I wanted to quickly introduce Scalding itself. Uh, I don't know, people may not be that familiar with this. Uh, so what exactly is Scalding? Scalding began its life as a Scala library for MapReduce. Uh, if you're familiar with the old MapReduce. You write your mapper classes, reducer classes, and put these together into a big pipeline, right? Um, so uh, this started life as purely a Scala li library for MapReduce. And originally, it was built on top of cascading. Cascading itself is a higher level abstraction for MapReduce. So the idea was you put together pipes. You connect these pipes of data as your data transformations. And underneath, cascading is really running multiple MapReduce jobs, right? And what uh, Scalding did was to just have exactly that same idea of uh, pipes put together, except in Scala. That's how it began. And as we use this, this must have been like 2014 or something, I think, when it started being used at Twitter. Um, it became very popular very quickly. And also, what we started to notice is that um, these transformations that you're expressing on data really didn't have to be tied, tied this closely with cascading. Right? These were very standard transformations that you could make on data. So uh, we went through, a 2016 it might have been, that we went through this major process of completely decoupling the backend from the API for Scalding itself. So, right? so Scalding became purely an API for which, in which you express your data computations. And you plug in a backend and you run it. And the only existing backend at the time was cascading. Right? And that's how we run it today also. So this was an important uh, step in the evolution of Scalding in that sense, right? So, and now uh, looking back at it, now you see other frameworks that come up, and they all have exactly the same ideas as uh, Scalding did many, many years ago. For example, Spark's RDD API looks a lot like Scalding's API. So does Beam in some sense. So, what does Scalding's API look like? The central abstraction is a type pipe, which is basically a distributed uh, collection. It's almost one-to-one -one with a P collection in Beam. Uh, you have a distributed collection of some data, and or Scala, or Spark RDDs, right? And once you have a type pipe, you construct a type pipe out of reading some data set, maybe like a file on HDFS. You do a bunch of standard transformations on the data, right? Map, flat map. Many of these might look really familiar to Beam users already. Map, flat map, filter, group by, etc. And it's also very easy to implement sources and syncs in Scalding. Uh, all you have to do is implement a few interfaces, read from sources, and um, read from whatever data source that you're trying to read from. The Scalding already has out of the box, I think, for HDFS. We've implemented some for BigQuery sources. We've implemented like JDBC connectors for MySQL and things like that. Right? So that's uh, the Scalding API. And you can, I think, pretty much for each one of these operations that you see in the Scalding API, there's almost a one-to-one -one corresponding thing in Beam or Spark or in, pick your data framework, right? So I thought I'll put in an example of a word count because it seems like word count is like the hello world of the data processing world, right? <laughs> so here's a word count in Scalding. Uh, it's only five lines of code, literally. This is a working word count uh, example. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're, you have a text file, right? And you want to count the number of occurrences of each unique word in this text file. How do you do it? It's pretty straightforward. Type pipe from first line is saying, OK, that's the source I'm reading from. It's a text line. It's some kind of source in Scalding. And you're accepting some path to a file, maybe uh, an argument called input. And you read that argument. That points to some text file. You construct a line from it. The next step, now you've got a type pipe whose elements are basically lines of text uh, from your source file. right? And once you've got that, uh, you flat map over it. And you convert this type pipe now into, uh, this is a transformation operation, right? the flat map operation. For each line of text, you basically do a line split. And that's the tokenized function below 
without going into the details, all it's doing is taking a line of text and splitting them into words. Now, your original type pipe that was a type pipe of lines of text now becomes a type pipe of words. Each element in your pipe is a, is a word, right? Now that you've got the words, you want to count them, right? What do you do? You just group each word by itself, sort of, right? Uh, this, this is saying group by a function that goes from word to word, meaning make the word the key, and the values are the list of all occurrences of that word in your text, right? Uh, now you've got a key val pipe where each key is each unique word in your uh, text file, and uh, the value is basically a list of occurrences of each word. Now when you call size on that, uh, what you get is the size of each group, which is basically a word count, right? For each word, what is the count? And now finally you decide to uh, write it to any kind of sync here. In this case, I'm writing it to a TSV file. Notice the two params are string and long, meaning string is the word, long is the number of occurrences of that word in that file. And I'm writing it to some path that uh, the user chose. And that's it. That's basically a word count program in Scalding, right? So the reason I have this example here is that will give you some context for what it means to implement a backend. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about what it means. How do you write a backend, right? So what does Scalding actually do when you write? Uh, if you go back, if I go back here, what is Scalding? What the user has done with Scalding? is to build up a series of computations on some initial data set, right? And this computation is represented in Scalding as a DAG, right? It's a directed acyclic graph of stuff. Um, and so the user code is submitted to a planner, and uh, that is basically a DAG of nodes. Uh, and finally, the last node in every DAG is usually a sync node, because almost every pipeline that you write, at the end, you're trying to write your data set. Uh, to some sort of sync, right? And uh, Scalding takes this DAG and passes it through a Scalding optimizer. And what the optimizer does is to uh, optimize away. There are some very interesting optimization rules within Scalding. For example, some may be similar to what Beam does, like fuse stages, right? So you can fuse a few operations together. You can drop some operations. Uh, there's many kinds of optimization rules that Scalding runs through. But finally, after all these, you get another DAG, which is hopefully uh, a smaller DAG than the original one that was submitted by the user. Finally, you take that list of uh, writes. The write is the final terminal node in the DAG, and submit it to a Scalding backend. Um, and once you submit it to the backend, the, uh, currently there are four backends in Scalding. One is the memory backend. Memory backend means there's no distributed computing involved at all. You're just on a single machine, uh, and you're running the entire pipeline in memory. Right, that's the mem it's the simplest backend. Uh, if you want to study how a Scalding backend is implemented, memory backend is a great place to start. Uh, cascading is the one we currently use in production. So it takes your Scalding DAG, converts it into a cascading DAG, which in turn gets submitted to MapReduce. We also have backends for Spark, and this one here is the Beam backend that I'm currently talking about. Right, so there are currently four backends in Scalding. This is a screenshot of our UI for Scalding jobs at Twitter. So if you launch a Scalding job at Twitter, you get this very nice looking Dr. Scalding is what we call it. That is a picture of the DAG that the user submitted, right? The user wrote a bunch of code. What that DAG, you kind of have to read it from left to right. So what this DAG is saying is I'm reading from two inputs. Those are the two dots on the left, right? Two nodes in the DAG doing a bunch of transformations of all sorts of things, and finally combining them and writing them to a single output, because it's got one output node, right? The reason the, the Dr. Scalding UI exists is for users to go debug a deployment, right? Like, you, I launched my Scalding job. Now it happens to fail at some point later. I can go and click through here, figure out which stage did it fail at, go access logs, try to debug this, right? So I just wanted to put this in here just to give you a sense of what a Scalding DAG looks like to a user once they submit to it. Um, how do Scalding backends work? So that's the user code gets written in Scalding. It's kind of what I spoke about earlier. It passes through an optimizer. You get an optimized DAG. And then how do, uh, how do backends get plugged into Scalding? It happens through something called a mode. We'll talk about that later. So mode is basically a trait in Scala that's basically telling Scalding, in what mode should I run this uh, pipeline that I've just implemented? And you've got three modes right now, right? You've got cascading mode, which basically launches it on cascading. Or you've got a Spark mode, which lets you run it with Spark. Or now this new Beam mode. 
that produces a beam pipeline out of this uh, scalding diagram. Uh, what do the uh, so in order to implement any scalding backend, really you just need to implement these two uh, interfaces. You just implement a mode. A mode's job is only to produce a writer. That is, when it gets a write, it knows what to do with it, right? And then, uh, so you first implement a mode, and you have to construct some writer of some kind. And what is a writer? If you look at it on the end of here, you can ignore the other stuff. Uh, the main part is right here, right? A writer just takes a list of writes, which is basically the terminal nodes in your DAG, and then you do whatever you want with it in your, um, in your code. Um, it so happens that for all the existing, and th this is it, this is all you need to implement. Uh, you implement these two whatever way you want, and you've got a scalding backend implemented, right? But it so happens that there's a common pattern that we follow for all the existing backends, and that happens to be a very convenient way to implement uh, one for scalding. So there's just a few steps to implement, right? So you, and usually this is how all of the backends, existing backends in scalding are done today. Uh, you first design an AST representation, a tree-like representation for your particular processing engine for, for which you're trying to implement this. Scalding has its own tree, like the DAG that I just showed you, right? And you implement uh, a corresponding one, uh, so we call it beam op for the beam backend, right? And there are, for each node in the scalding DAG, uh, you have a corresponding node in your beam DAG. So you're going to produce a beam DAG from this. Then you implement a function that simply takes a type pipe which is Scalding's tree, and knows how to convert this into the beam tree, right? And obviously, you need resol the resolver is simply for converting sources and things, right? So if you have a Scalding source, you have to know what to do. Uh, in beam, it's probably going to end up becoming a beam IO of some sort, right? And you put all these together in a writer, and you're done. So this is just really a pattern for how to go about doing this. And I thought I might as well show an example of how a very simple operator is done in the beam backend so that you get a sense of this. So here's my, in fact, uh, fully working scalding program, right? It's an extremely simple thing, a program to understand. All it's doing is I'm constructing type pipe from elements in memory. I've got a sequence of one, two, and three, and another sequence of four, five, and six, two arrays, basically. I've built two type pipes from them, A and B. Then the plus plus operator in scalding is a union. So I've union the two pipes. So my union is basically one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And finally, I want to write this pipe out uh, uh, to maybe, uh, in this case, to a TSV file. Scalding will look at this code and produce some kind of DAG. And here's the DAG it produces, right? At the bottom of the tree are two uh, iterable pipes. We can ignore that for And that's from basically reading the two uh, elements in the sequence, right? And the union is represented as a merge pipe. That's a new kind of tree in, in Scalding. So that's a merge type pipe. And the parent of the merge is a write, because finally you're uh, writing something, right? And this is the DAG that we submit to um, uh, the Scalding backend. And uh, this will obviously go through an optimizer. In this particular case, because this pipe is so simple, this DAG is so simple, I don't think optimizer would do anything with this. It's probably going to come out exactly the same way. Uh, now, uh, the only interesting part really is this merged pipe. Is a, it, it represents the union of its children, right? Because the union operator over here. So let's look at how a merged pipe would exist, would be translated in the beam world. What do you need to do in beam to implement this merged pipe? Uh, like I said earlier, what you do is uh, you have a corresponding operator in the beam AST, right? So beam op is our beam AST, basically. And you'd have a merged beam op for each merged pipe. What does the merge beam op do? It basically takes at least two arguments, a first beam op, a second beam op, possibly more, a tail, uh, a sequence of beam ops. And it has to merge them in some way, right? And uh, you implement the merge by overriding the run method of that op. And the run method signature, if you look at it, it gets a beam pipeline and produces a peak collection of some sort. And this code, if you've worked with the beam API, must be pretty easy to follow, right? You, what do you do with the beam? You want to merge the first, second, and the tail. How do you do this? You take the first and run the pipeline on it. You'll get some sort of peak collection from that. You take the second and run the pipeline on it. You get another peak collection. And for each element in the tail, you do exactly the same thing. Now you get a list of peak collections. Uh, you construct a list out of all of this. You've got a list of peak collections. And now you flatten 
them. That's basically the union in uh, Beam, right? If you had to union a bunch of peak collections, this is what you would do. And that's it. You've implemented one uh, merge beam. And this is really, I think it's almost like code that I copy pasted from the open. So this is exactly how it is done. Um, and uh, the other part is how do you, now that you've seen it merged pipe, how do you go to the merged beam op, right? So uh, this is that function that takes a type pipe and then produces the beam operators on it. And here it's very, I've just uh, pulled out this snippet that converts uh, the merged pipe alone, right? So as you, so you can think of this part of code as what you see when you're visiting the, uh, it's like a visitor pattern. You're visiting the scalding DAG and now you've hit a node that happens to be a merged type pipe. What do you need to do with it, right? Uh, how do you convert it into a merged beam op? Uh, this part is not so important. You can ignore it for the moment. We run some kind of optimization rule on the merged thing, and it results in a list of uh, pipes. As a result, you get a list out of it. But imagine that it's a list of just the children of, of the merge, right? all of the children of the merge. What can happen when you've got a list of type pipes? The list can have three cases, really. I'm sorry, there's a bunch of Scala code here, but most of it is pretty easy to follow, even if you haven't seen <laughs> Scala before. Uh, 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 you've got a list now. There are three cases in a list. The list is either empty or it's got one single element in it or it's got two or more elements in it, right? And what we're saying is if the list is empty, you just take that, uh, call this function recursively. That rec is meaning is just a recursive call. You call the function recursively of an empty type pipe with an empty type pipe because empty list means an empty type pipe, right? If the list has just a single element, call it recursively with that single element, because we don't know what the type of that single element is. Call it, and it'll sort itself out, right? And if the list has two or more elements, that's when you need to do a merge, all right? So then in that case, you just construct a merged beam op, and uh, you do exactly what you do, uh, like in the earlier case. You recursively call it on the first, you recursively call it on the second. Each of these will return a beam op, uh, same thing for the tail, and then you merge them all together with a merged beam op. And that's the implementation. This is basically the entire implementation of a very simple uh, operation on uh, a scalding type pipe, right? So that kind of gives you a sense of how you go about implementing a backend. Um, so where are we right now with this? We are currently in the process of uh, testing these uh, pipelines by deploying them on Google's data flow using the Scarling backend. And we have tested this on pretty complex pipelines written by users. We have very, very complicated Scarling jobs uh, running at Twitter. What we have established up to this point is correctness. We know for sure that if you wrote a Scarling job and deployed it with the Beam backend, the results that you get are exactly the same as what you would have got with cascading for example, right? Or what they've been producing with Cascade. So we, we have that uh, uh, correctness already established. And what we're working on right now, uh, there are a few missing features. Uh, one is the distributed cache feature. If you work with MapReduce, there is this concept of distributed cache where you can basically, if you have a very small uh, in-memory data, you can have it distributed to all the workers in your MapReduce job, right? Uh, the corresponding idea in the Beam world is uh, side inputs, I think, right? The problem here is Scalding does not expose in its API distributed cache really well. So it's hard to do the translation to site input. So we haven't figured that out yet. Um, similarly, if your job makes use of MapReduce counters, it's the same as Beam counters. But again, Scalding does not expose this really well. So we have not been able to, uh, we're still figuring out how we translate counters. Um, a big issue we saw with uh, working with some of these pipelines is debuggability. What happens is, suppose you launched your job, you ran it on Google's data flow, for example, your Beam job, and your job fails at some point. The difficulty is you don't know now how to trace this back to what part of my original Scalding code actually produced this DAG in Beam, and where did it actually fail, right? So that's making things a little difficult for us. So we're trying to improve how we debug uh, these pipelines. And then also performance. This is an ongoing area where we, we're still trying to figure out. We've seen some cases where handwritten uh, Beam jobs, where handwritten uh, migrations seem to be performing better in certain cases than the data flow, uh, than the version produced by this Beam backend. 
we're still trying to figure out where. So I think there's a lot of areas where we can improve what this backend is actually doing. Um, yeah, so that's, I believe, all I had for this. And, and yeah, we're in the process of trying to do this pretty large migration using this thing. So I, I expect that there'll be a lot of improvements to this going forward. That's all I had. Thanks.